All right, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, faithfulness in the face of challenge. This is the final lesson in the series, lesson number 10. And the um, title of this lesson is Renewal of Covenant and Moses' Final Days. And we will, if the Lord wills, cover uh, Deuteronomy chapter 27 to 34. So this is a final lesson, as I said, to the book of Deuteronomy. Over the past sessions, we have embarked on a demanding journey through the first 26 chapters of this pivotal book, where Moses addresses the Israelites on the plains of Moab just before they enter the promised land. So as we prepare to conclude our study, let us briefly review the key themes key themes and instructions that Moses relayed to God's people at that time, ensuring that they carried these lessons with them as they crossed the Jordan River into their new home. So here are the key themes, here we go. In chapters one to three, there was a historical review. Moses begins by recounting the journey from Horeb or Sinai through the wilderness, highlighting pivotal moments such as the appointment of leaders and judges to assist him, the refusal to enter the land due to fear after the spy's negative report, and the subsequent warn, uh, wanderings as a consequence of their disbelief. Chapter four, there was an exhortation to obedience. Moses urges the Israelites to remain faithful to God, faithful to his statutes and the instructions they've received. He highlights the importance of their unique covenant with God and he warns against idolatry, emphasizing that their success in the promised land hinges on their adherence to the laws given at Horeb. Their survival is not based on their military or the abundance of their crops or how big their houses are, but it depends on their adherence to the laws given to them at Horeb. That was a very important point. Chapters five to 11, the covenant and the law. Moses reiterates the 10 commandments and expounds further on the covenant between God and Israel. He uh, reminds them of their special status as God's chosen people. And of course, the blessings that come from obedience alongside the terrible consequences for turning away from God. In chapters 12 to 16, uh, he kind of goes a little deeper into specific laws and regulations. These chapters, they lay out detailed laws that govern various aspects of Israel, uh, Israelite life, including worship practices, dietary rules, annual festivals, social justice, as well as legal procedures. The laws are designed to set Israel apart from other nations and to ensure that they live in harmony and righteousness. And so Moses stresses the importance of central worship. Remember we talked about that, that there was a central place for worship, uh, the necessity of justice and fairness and the need for compassion and generosity towards those who were less fortunate. And throughout these chapters, 12 to 26, Moses emphasizes that the law is not merely a set of rules, but it's a way to cultivate a relationship with God and ensure the well-being of the community in the land that they were going into, a land flowing with milk and honey. The recurring theme is clear. Obedience to God's commandments leads to blessings, while disobedience leads to destruction and to uh, despair. And so as we transition to the final chapters of Deuteronomy, we'll see Moses preparing the Israelites, not only with final instructions, but with a sense of hope and responsibility. The, uh, uh, this foundation rather that we have explored is critical as they stand on the brink of a new beginning, ready to fulfill the promise given to their uh, forefathers. And so this introduction sets the stage for the concluding lessons connecting the early teachings in Deuteronomy to the responsibilities and challenges that await the Israelites as they prepare to enter in and inherit the promised land. And so let me give you a little summary of uh, chapter 27. Um, in cha uh, chapter 27 to uh, chapter 34 of the book of Deuteronomy, uh, these chapters present a sequence of events and instructions 
that are critical to the Israelites as they prepare to enter and possess the promised land. So here's a brief summary of these chapters with references and their significance, which will enhance your reading assignment of this material uh, in the coming week. And so in chapter 27, we have uh, the altar on Mount Ebal. The Israelites are instructed to set up an altar of uncut stones on Mount Ebal upon entering the promised land where they are to offer sacrifices and here importantly, write the laws that they've received down on these stones. Uh, Deuteronomy 27, one to eight. This serves as a reaffirmation of the covenant with God, emphasizing the permanence of the law in their new life and uh, territory. They enter a new territory and right at the border, they write down the laws uh, uh, which will govern their lives uh, so as not to forget from the very beginning uh, the things that will sustain them in this, uh, in this new land. In chapter 28, you have blessings and curses. Moses details the blessings that will come from obedience to God's commands, as well as the curses uh, that will result from disobedience to his commands, uh, Deuteronomy 28, one to 68. This chapter underscores the conditional aspect of Israel's relationship with God, directly tying their prosperity and success in the land to their fidelity to his commands. Obedience brings blessings, disobedience brings punishment. Boy, that theme <laughs> comes back over and over and over again in this book. We go on to chapter uh, 29. The covenant renewed, uh, this time while they are in Moab. You see on the map there, a simplified map, the, uh, the uh, territory of Moab. This was the uh, jumping off point, if you wish, uh, for their entry by crossing the river into Jericho. And so Moses formally renews the covenant with the Israelites in Moab warning them about the dangers of idolatry and of course the consequences of turning from God or turning away from God, Deuteronomy 29. This renewal is pivotal as it serves to remind the Israelites of their unique relationship with God and the history of their deliverance, reinforcing their commitment as they stand on the brink of the promised land. He reminds them, remember who you were, you were slaves, you had no chance. Uh, you had no rights, you had no future, and God rescued you and brings you to this new land that you will take over. Uh, and it, it doesn't mention it here, but uh, a land where houses have already been built and vineyards have already been planted and orchard have already been harvested. You're going in and just taking over all of these things, you know, but remember uh, uh, that uh, your success will depend not on your military power, but will depend on your obedience uh, to God. In uh, chapter 30, uh, there's the offer of life or death. Moses presents a choice between life and death, urging the Israelites, of course, to choose life by loving and obeying God, Deuteronomy 30. This chapter highlights the free will. Uh, very interesting uh, for uh, the Calvinists, you know, the Calvinists who, uh, create their doctrine of depravity and election. You know, they cannot use these chapters here as a basis for the doctrine of election and uh, the doctrine of depravity because these chapters highlight the free will that the Jews must exercise in order to remain uh, successful and prosperous in uh, the new, uh, in the the new land uh, that they've been given by God. Chapter 31, here we see uh, Joshua uh, becomes Moses's successor. Moses announces his impending death and he appoints Joshua as his successor. Moses also commands that the law be read every seven years to all of Israel, Deuteronomy 31 verses one to 13. This transition of leadership to Joshua is crucial for maintaining a continuity and stability. The public reading of the law ensures that future generations will remain knowledgeable and committed to the covenant. And of course, this was necessary at a time where written materials uh, were scarce. It wasn't as if every family had a copy of the law. So rereading the law 
uh, on, a, on a regular basis was uh, necessary. So now chapter 32, we have the song of uh, Moses here. Very interesting, uh, Moses recites a song that recounts the history of the Israelites and predicts their future infidelity and also God's uh, mercy towards them. Deuteronomy 32, one to 43. The song serves as a prophetic reminder of God's justice and mercy intended to keep the Israelites committed to God's ways as they will face uh, future uh, challenges. And we'll go a little deeper into that song uh, in a moment. Uh, chapter 33, Moses blesses the tribes. Before his death, he blesses the 12 tribes of Israel, speaking prophetically over their future in the land, Deuteronomy 33, uh, one to uh, 29. These blessings outline the roles and the fates of the tribes, providing encouragement and divine assurance as they prepare to settle in the promised land. And then finally, chapter 34 uh, talks about the death of Moses. Moses views the promised land from Mount Nebo and then he dies there. God buries him in Moab and then Joshua takes over as the leader of the Israelites. Uh, Moses' death marks the end of an era and the fulfillment of God's promise that he would see but not enter the land. And so Joshua's leadership symbolizes a new beginning and the continuation of the covenant. And so these chapters collectively emphasize the importance of covenant fidelity, leadership transition, and moral choices as the basic elements for the Israelites' success in their new homeland. It won't be about wealth, it won't be about strong armies, it'll be about faithfulness to God and holy living that will guarantee their blessed lifestyle as well as their uh, uh, abundance. I want to uh, do a bit of an exercise here, uh, demonstrate uh, the main differences between Deuteronomy uh, chapters one to 26, and then the change that takes place from Deuteronomy 27 to 34. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy is structured as a series of speeches by Moses to the Israelites before they enter the promised land. Now, while the first 26 chapters focus on reviewing history and reiterating the law, and emphasizing the importance of covenantal uh, obedience, chapter 27 to 34 shifts towards preparing for immediate future actions, leadership transition, and the practical steps necessary for entering and living in the land. So here are four main differences between these two sections in the book of Deuteronomy. The first difference is uh, between content and focus. Uh, chapters one to 26 review, uh, is a review of the past. Moses recounts the journey from Egypt, the giving of the law at Sinai and their wanderings in the desert. Uh, there's extensive coverage of civil, criminal and ceremonial laws, including specifics on worship and justice and societal issues. Uh, and then there are general exhortations. Moses emphasizes general principles of obedience and faithfulness and the consequences of Israel's choices between blessings and curses. That's in chapters one to 26. Chapters 27 to 34, uh, there are commands about building an altar on Mount Ebal, uh, the procedure for blessings and curses and the specific actions to take once they enter the land. There's also leadership succession uh, the designation of Joshua as Moses' successor, and instructions for the transfer of leadership. Also, there are future predictions and warnings. Uh, remember we mentioned the Song of uh, Moses? Song of Moses serves as a prophetic outline of Israel's future disobedience and God's uh, faithfulness. And then the blessing of the tribes. Moses gives uh, specific blessings to each tribe which include prophecies about their roles and their uh, uh, specific futures in uh, the land. A second uh, difference between these two is uh, tone and, and emphasis. Uh, chapters one to 26 is instructional and directive. Uh, Moses teaches the law as a foundational element for living as a community under God's rule. Uh, he encourages 
uh, adherence to the law through reminders of God's past deeds and the promise of future blessings and obedience. And then in chapters 27, 34 is more ceremonial and prophetic. There is a strong ceremonial aspect as Moses directs the people to perform specific rituals that symbolize uh, their uh, covenantal uh, renewal. And also Moses reflects on the nation's future challenges and God's ongoing relationship with Israel, focusing on the broader spiritual and historical implications of their uh, covenant uh, with God. Uh, a third difference, uh, the audience engagement is, is different. In chapters one to 26, there's uh, the idea of national identity and memory. Uh, a reinforcement of Israel's identity as God's chosen people and their call to remember their history and remember the laws that were given to them. And then in chapters 27, 34, it's all about preparation for the future, uh, preparation for immediate and concrete actions that they must undertake upon entering the land, emphasizing you know, the practical outworking of their covenantal uh, relationship in the land. And then finally, the fourth difference their ultimate goals. Uh, chapters one to 26 is more holistic, the holistic understanding of the law, uh, providing a comprehensive framework for living under God's rule, covering all the aspects of personal and uh, communal uh, life. And then in chapters 27 to 34 is ensuring uh, covenant continuity and blessing. In other words, ensuring that the transition into the promised land is marked by covenant renewal, leadership continuity, and divine blessing. All of this setting the stage for future prosperity and faithfulness. And so in essence, while the first 26 chapters lays a broad foundation of history and law, chapters 27 to 34 focus on immediate actions, future predictions, and final preparations for life in the promised land, all of it aimed at reinforcing the Israelites commitment to their covenant with God as they face a significant transition. Um, I want to talk about the uh, significant use of poetry in this, uh, uh, in this section of uh, Deuteronomy. Moses's use of poetry in chapters 27 to 34 of the book of Deuteronomy, particularly the Song of Moses in chapter 32 is significant for several reasons. First, uh, it's emotional uh, and artistic uh, expression. Uh, poetry with its rhythmic and metaphorical qualities is well suited for expressing deep emotions and complex theological ideas in a powerful and in a, a, mem a memorable way. Moses uses poetry to evoke a strong emotional response from the Israelites, helping them to feel the gravity of their covenant with God and the serious consequences of obedience or disobedience. Uh, the second one is memorability. Uh, the poetic form simplifies the memorizing of Moses's message. Poetry by its very nature is easier to recall than prose. Uh, which is particularly important in an oral culture where laws and histories uh, were handed down from one generation to another using oral uh, tradition. The Israelites could more easily remember and pass down the teachings and warnings contained in Moses's song. A third reason for poetry was for prophecy and teaching content. The song of Moses serves both prophetic and instructional purposes. It outlines the history and the future of Israel, warning about the dangers of apostasy and the assurance of God's justice as well as his uh, mercy. Poetry enhances these themes, making uh, prophetic messages more striking and the instruction more uh, profound. Uh, another reason, uh, there's the covenant renewal and the solemnity the use of poetry in this context underscores the solemnity and the sacredness of the, co uh, of the covenant renewal process. As the Israelites prepare to enter the promised land, the poetic form serves as a solemn reminder of the responsibilities and the seriousness of their commitment to God. Another reason for poetry is cultural and historical continuity. 
In many ancient Near Eastern cultures, important historical and legal texts were often composed in poetry. Moses' use of poetry connects these traditions with the Israelite experience, providing a sense of continuity and legitimacy. It, it, it aligns the Israelites' covenant experience with a broader cultural practice of that time, emphasizing its importance and its uh, sacredness. Also, theological depth. Poetry allows for a depth of theological expression that prose may not as easily convey. Uh, through vivid imagery and dramatic presentation, Moses communicates complex ideas about God's character, his justice, his mercy, his faithfulness, and of course, the ideal behavior expected from his people. And then finally, it enhances the community identity. The poetic sections of Deuteronomy serve to strengthen community identity. As the Israelites recite and remember these poems collectively, they reinforce shared values and communal commitments under their covenant with God. They're remembering the same poem and that poetry is giving them the same information and the same instructions. And so through poetry, uh, uh, God is, uh, is bringing the people closer together and unifying them in thought. And so in summary, Moses' use of poetry in these critical chapters of Deuteronomy is a, is a strategic and effective way to communicate, to uh, commemorate, and to deepen the covenantal experience as the Israelites stand on the threshold of a new phase in their relationship with God. It's a powerful literary choice that enhances the spiritual impact of his final uh, messages. And so the book of Deuteronomy is rich in teachings and lessons that span theological, practical, and unique aspects, each deriving from the varied layers of content that it presents. So here are three takeaway lessons from three different perspectives. First, the theological perspective. From the theological perspective, the lesson is the centrality of the idea of covenant. The idea of covenant is you know, all the way through uh, the book of uh, Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy emphasizes the centrality of the covenant between God and Israel. It reiterates the laws given at Sinai and details the blessings of obedience and the curse of disobedience, underlining the covenant as not merely a legal agreement, but as a deep relational bond between God and his people. That's what bonded the people together. They had, uh, together with God, they had a covenant. God said, if you do this, I will give you this. If, if you do that, I promise that these things will happen. That was the covenant. And so this highlights a fundamental theological principle. The relationship with God is governed by faithfulness to his commands and is rooted in his unchanging character and promises. In other words, the covenant that he has, he will keep. If he says he will bless you if you obey him in a covenant arrangement, he will do that. You can count on that. And so this theological insight invites believers to reflect on the nature of their relationship with God. It, it encourages a commitment that goes beyond mere rule following to embrace a relational based on a relationship rather based on love, trust, and obedience uh, to God's will. A second lesson, which is the practical, from a practical, you know, we looked at it from a theological perspective, from a practical perspective is the importance of memory in sustaining faith. You know, throughout Deuteronomy, Moses continually calls on Israel to remember their past, both the miraculous deliverance from Egypt and their failures of faith. This act of remembrance serves as a practical purpose. It grounds the people's faith in concrete historical realities, ensuring that future generations understand their identity and moral obligations. In other words, their religion wasn't based on a mystery. It wasn't based on a, on a fable. Uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't based on uh, unknown things. Their faith was based on historical facts. 
And the idea of remembering this, his, these historical facts was what grounded them in their faith in God. Practically, this teaches the importance of memory and history in sustaining faith and moral conduct. By remembering God's past actions, we're inspired to trust and obey Him in the present. You know, I've often said to myself, uh, has He ever let me down? Uh, when I've asked Him to help me, has He ever refused to help me? Uh, has, he, has He ever uh, not come to my rescue in one way or another? You know, sometimes we have to look to the past at what God has done for us uh, in memory in order to secure a stronger faith in the present. So this principle can be applied in our lives today by keeping spiritual journals or regular attendance for worship or Bible study and fellowship events and teaching the Bible as well as the church's history to younger generations, not just the Bible, but teach them the history of uh, the church, not just uh, the history of the church in the Bible, but the history of our own congregations. So they have a sense of history, a sense of past, how the congregation where you belong, how it was formed and what it went through to continue to survive and some of the difficult things it may have experienced that God has uh, helped them to go through. That becomes uh, you know, a communal history and something that uh, builds faith. And then a third lesson, um, and this time from uh, a, a perspective unique uh, from Deuteronomy, and that is God's people love other people. We see that in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is unique in its detailed requirements for loving others as a sign of credibility, which includes the care for the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner. The book provides specific laws that ensure these vulnerable groups are protected and supported. This emphasis is a distinctive aspect of Deuteronomy, highlighting a society where justice and compassion go hand in hand with faithfulness to the covenant with God. This unique focus on loving one's neighbor challenges both individual believers and congregations of the church today to consider how their actions affect the most vulnerable and to actively engage in practices that fulfill Jesus's mandate in Matthew 25 to care for the poor and the sick, the imprisoned, the hungry, and others who suffer in our society today. Uh, this was not a new thing that Jesus introduced, but rather something that went as far back as Moses and his instructions to the people who were entering the promised land. Loving others was part of the religion uh, back in Moses' time, just as it is part of our Christianity today. These lessons from Deuteronomy teach us something vital about living a life that is pleasing to God on one hand, while being beneficial to the community in which we live and worship on the other. This was combining a holistic approach to spirituality and ethics, which was unknown outside the nation of Israel at that time and constituted the light in the darkness that God was bringing to mankind through his chosen people then and through his church today. I recognize the fact that Deuteronomy is a reflection of uh, the light that the Jews uh, were supposed to uh, show uh, other nations through the various rules and regulations that they followed. And in the same way, uh, we as disciples of Jesus, by following his example and his life and his teachings, we also become a light uh, in the darkness of the world in which we live uh, today. Well, that's our uh, final lesson uh, for the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy. I wanna thank you for your attention and I encourage you to reread uh, the section that we covered today so that you have a firm grip on the meaning of the book of Deuteronomy. I pray that you will uh, grow and uh, mature in the knowledge of God's word. And I hope to see you uh, another time as we, uh, as we begin to study another uh, portion of God's word. Bye-bye for now.